Well, I'm joined now by Nick Kyrgios. The interview nobody on planet Earth thought would ever happen is now about to happen. So, Nick, how are you? Good, Piers. How are you? How's everything going? Well, I thought it might be useful for viewers who are not familiar with our beef, I believe is the vernacular term these days, to go over the beef over the last few years and explain how we reached this place. Um, it goes back to 2016. You played Andy Murray. Sounds good. Uh, you threw... A, yep. a legendary strop, even by your standards, and I tweeted the following. Never seen an Australian sulk like Kyrgios. Normally ferocious, proud competitors. Embarrassing. Uh, I then added, you should put your toys back in the pram, to which you responded, EAD. Now, I didn't know what EAD meant until one of my sons informed me it meant eat a dick. <laughs> so perhaps we could start with that one, Nick. Uh, um, <laughs> It was a very, you know, it was a very to the point comment. Uh, do you have any regrets about your response or did you think it was fair enough? Um, yeah, I think it was, I think it was warranted, definitely. Um, <laughs> I actually sent that from a, from a restaurant. I had a couple beers and I saw your comment on Twitter and I was just like, I'm in no mood to deal with anything like this at the moment. And I just sent it. So, yeah, I mean, look. Andy Murray, he's an absolute legend of the sport, and yeah, I got I got given a lesson that day, and yeah, it was not a good showing for me, but I guess a couple of years later I made the final of Wimbledon, so you would have enjoyed seeing that, right, Piers? <laughs> well, funny enough, you weren't the only person to to come back at me with a comment like that on Twitter around that period. Rihanna, uh, I told her to grow her hair after she revealed some short bob when she appeared on stage in London. And she replied, grow a dick. So there was a running theme to, uh, to global figures uh, basically calling me a dick in various ways. I mean, you, you can't blame her for calling you one. Sometimes <laughs> you are a, a, bit of a, a bit of a dick, I guess. <laughs> well, I've got to say, coming from you, pot kettle. <laughs> <laughs> now, look, I've been called a lot worse than that. <laughs> well, let's move to the second phase of the, of the beef. Uh, in an interview with the New York Times after this exchange, which got a bit of traction online, as we know, uh, you, confessed, mm -hmm. you confessed you never watched tennis yep. and you responded, no chance, Jesus, I'd rather watch Piers Morgan. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, that's, that's actually a compliment. You should take that as a compliment <laughs> because I'd actually probably rather watch one of your segments on TV than uh, a tennis match. So that's actually, I don't know why you would take that as beef. That's a compliment. Like, you're, you're entertaining. So, and we all know that... That's why people watch me from time to time. It's not also about the quality. It's just about, you know, how much fun am I going to have in 30 minutes? So I'd rather watch you for sure. Definitely. That's a compliment. Look, I'm, I, I, we could be friends. I think, you're, 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 I think we're very alike. You know what? We're probably more alike than I would care to admit. And I suspect we will be friends after this. Um, we, we, things move forward then to Wimbledon last year. Obviously, you're on a tear. You're playing fantastically. You are a genius yep. tennis player. I'm going to put that on the table now. I love watching you play. However, the, you, you can let yourself down, Nick. Let's just put it politely. Uh, and on one occasion during the tournament, you let yourself down and you were throwing stuff yep. around and abusing everyone. And I labelled you on this show the douche of the day. Let's have, take a look at the clip. One of my least favourite people, Nick Kyrgios. <laughs> You know what, bro? You're my douche of the day every day. If you're watching, Mr. Kyrgios, I think you do watch the show. Just grow up, you big baby. <laughs> Any thoughts? <laughs> yeah, but, OK, look, I'm not going to sit here and say that I'm on my best behaviour all the time, but these clips that you show are only, like, 10 to 15 seconds worth of what the tennis match is. There's four or three to four hours where I'm incredibly well behaved, I'm in, like competing and I'm playing world-class tennis, then you choose to show 10 seconds of a four hour match. I mean, I can't control that. But yeah. I do understand like sometimes, yeah, I, I could be a douche on the tennis court, but that's just what it is. I mean, let's be clear. It, it, I do hours and hours a week of, of live television. Uh, I think to a pretty high standard, but if I was to spend yeah. 10 seconds every week very throwing, nice throwing things at the cameraman and uh, swearing and shouting and throwing my toys out of the pram, people would focus on that, Nick. <clears throat> Probably not the rest of my programming. OK, but again, you're, you're, uh, again you are exaggerating. It's not every week. It's not every week. There goes, there's like months and months where nothing happens and then the minute something happens again, you just 
say that, oh, he, here he is doing it again, where it could be like a six months hiatus of me not doing anything. So, I mean, look, there's only so much control I can have. Well, the main reason you... And you're also acting as if I'm the only tennis player who does these things. No, like, no, you're not. Got, you're you know, not. But some you're... of the legends of the sport have broken rackets. Oh, yes. Well, well... No, no, you're the modern day John well, McEnroe. I'm going to come to that because I know that well, you've got a, you've developed a bit of a rapport with McEnroe. But let's go back to Wimbledon again uh, in the same tournament. Uh, I then had a strange okay. feeling. It was a strange feeling came over me because there was this furore about you wearing your Jordans, um, and you kept insisting on doing it. And you had an altercation with a journalist, and I suddenly yep. found myself tweeting the following. I said. He's such an unrelenting, uncompromising douchebag that, to my horror, I'm actually beginning to warm to Nick Kyrgios. What, why to your horror? Why, why, <laughs> why are you afraid of liking me? I'm just myself. I'm not going to conform to, like... Uh, look, Wimbledon, for me, is the pinnacle of tennis, if not one of the biggest sports, sporting um, you know, events we have in the world. So I have utmost respect for everything that it represents. And every time I'm there, I... You know, I, I have goosebumps. I, I understand the, this, the relevance of the event. And, you know, I think I just put my touch on it. I'm not trying to change Wimbledon, but Nick Kyrgios is trying to bring his touch towards Wimbledon with, you know, a slight red hat or some red Jordans. The majority of it is white. Like, I'm wearing white. I'm going out there playing in front of millions of fans, you know, giving the, you know, England uh, some, some good tennis. So I don't understand why I got so much hate for that. And I think that's a picture that I'll remember for the rest of my life. You know, that's when Nick Kyrgios is all said and done in his tennis career. We're making the Wimbledon final, putting on that red hat, meeting the Queen and, you know, doing that is, is, is pretty cool, I think. So I can understand why you're warming up to me. Well, I was definitely warming up to you. And then we met an incredible common ground. We discovered we feel exactly the same way about somebody else in the world of sport, and it was Megan Rapino, the uh, female soccer player, oh. as they call it, in America. And it came after this clip where she uh, basically treated a young boy trying to get a, an autograph, I thought was a, appalling dismissiveness. Have we got the clip? Well, I gave my, my pretty strong views about this on Twitter, uh, and you actually replied, ha, 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 one thing me and Piers agree on. So we finally <laughs> bonded over Megan Rapino being a spoiled, <laughs> petulant brat. Yeah, look, again, I'm not going to come on here and, and you know, criticise athletes. I know that she's got, you know, millions of fans worldwide and in this moment in time she may have been dealing with things and you may, may be very dismissive I'm, I'm not going to sit here and say i've been amazing to every fan that i've ever signed um you know a tennis ball for or anything for but you know every time you know it's it's a young kind of kid i do my best to try and look involved because i used to be that person when i was um young you know i had my idols and when they signed tennis balls for me i was always super Super excited. So I know the relevance and, and the importance of being present in those moments. And, you know, someone like me that I don't know if you know because you dislike mm -hmm. me so much, I actually try and give back a lot to the community and, and spend um, time with kids. And, and, you know, I actually met a Make-A-Wish kid, you know, a couple of weeks ago and I enjoy that type of stuff. So, um, yeah, I mean, I don't really like the dismissiveness, but, you know, I haven't been perfect either. Well, let me, be, let me just put this on the table. Uh, I've actually grown to really like you. And that may be the worst thing you hear from me all day, but I, I actually have because Thank you. I watched the, the Netflix uh, thing, uh, found out a lot more about you, about your life, about your upbringing, what you'd come through, um, and the honesty I felt that you brought to what you'd gone through and the self-awareness that you had. I felt, I mean, look, I, w I wouldn't use a phrase as patronising as it felt like you'd grown up but it definitely felt like you'd evolved as a human being and were able to look back mm -hmm. on that period when we first locked horns and recognise that that was not a yep. path to any glory. That was just going to be completely self-defeating. Would, would that be fair? Yeah, I think we all, we all grow up at our, own, um, at our own pace. But, yeah, definitely, look, uh, to look where I was in 2016 where you and I had the run-in. And, look, a bit of credit would have been nice from you. I mean, it was fourth round of Wimbledon against one of the greatest of all time. I thought True. that in itself was a pretty good achievement. But, um, <laughs> yeah, look, I've grown up um, immensely. Um, I look back at, you know, those Twitter beefs that I've had. I've had one with you. I've had one with Drake. And I just look back and I'm just saying, like, these are just so 
so silly. And uh, when I've met all these people that I've had beef with, we actually get along extremely well. I mean, I could imagine that you and I could go for a beer and for a drink and we'd have a great time with all the stories and experiences that we've both had. But yeah, that I guess that Netflix um, series was really good for me personally because it gave a bit of background into, you know, people think that I've been entitled and got given everything off a plate. But, you know, when I was young, I, my, my family didn't have much. You know, I had to kind of work for everything that was thrown my way and yeah, you know, I went through my own struggles and it was common struggles that most people do go through. So that's why I'm very relatable. So I think that's why it was very important. It was an interesting part of the Netflix thing where you, you the shows about some of the critics you've had and I, I pop up. Let's take a look at that. You were mm. having a bit of a interaction with yeah. the line judges and at one point I think you said, you're in your 90s, you can't see the ball. I hit a ball in, Right. the old man called it out, it was in. So arguably, if the guy was 40, he may not have called that out. Do you have any sympathy with how sometimes they're treated by, by players, for example? Well, these? they're not getting abused on social media. Like, I have to deal with... My girlfriend deals with hate messages. My family deals with hate messages. I deal with hate messages. OK, thank you very no much. Worries. Thank you. Thank you very much. The man's out of control. Can you put up any defence for this Antipodean monster? There's plenty of Australians who think he's an absolute tool. <laughs> i got to say, it's, it's slightly awkward looking at some of the stuff I said about you with you sitting there watching me as I do it. But, um, but in a way, you kind of brought that okay. treatment on yourself. You know, it, I would argue. I think you felt like it was part of your brand. You're an un un uncompromising, brash character right and you probably factored in well this is going to make me more interesting right mm, not on, not not on that particular day first of all Aaron Molan that person the Australian support, uh, reporter I have no idea who that person is so mm. her opinion to me doesn't matter and I'm, I'm I'm happy she had her five minutes of fame but um <laughs> also yeah that day like I've just played a four and a half hour match and I brought my food into the press conference because I'm not sure I'm not sure if you've been an elite athlete before but <laughs> when you finish a match at four for four hours you need to fuel your body because it's a like a very crucial part of your recovery so I thought I'd bring my sushi in to the press conference room because I had media to do and I didn't want to make people wait because people have bookings for the media room so there's a lot of things that happen behind the scenes that I got criticized for and you know many other tennis players have brought beers into the press conference room eating in the press conference room and they don't get absolutely battered in the media for it. I just bought some sushi and thought I'd kill two birds with one stone, get my media done, look after my nutrition, be professional. But obviously that got taken out for a spin and it was like, oh, he's eating in a press conference room. He's, he's Judas. Um, <laughs> but, you know, that was, that was hard. But, I mean, why would we... I, I just don't understand. It's Wimbledon. It's one of the biggest sporting events in the world with millions of dollars on the line. Why would we let line, line calls be given to chance why would we not have ele electric line calling or at least give the players the best chance to compete in a fair environment so I'm, I'm just very black and white I, i'm not trying to act i just strongly believe that there should be electronic line calling mm. because then it doesn't leave hundreds and thousands of dollars on the line to maybe a chance or a bad day or or someone or something like that it and sorry that i was just looking after my nutrition with with five bits of sushi my goodness jeez you know what, Sorry, Nick? I, will, uh, I had to eat. I'll give you the. I'll give you the first point. I agree with you about the line calling. It is ridiculous if you have some old crusty at Wimbledon who can barely see straight, ruling something out when it's in or the other way around. Thank you. I'm not going to give you sushi because Roger Federer would never do that because mm -hmm. he's too classy, and he'd have too much respect for the journalists. So that you're, gonna, you're not going to okay, get a pass on that. But I'm not Roger Federer. You can't expect everyone to be Roger Federer. You can't, you can't do that. That's unfair. That's very unfair. That means 99% of the tennis tour are not up to Roger Federer's standard. That, that's sport. That's personality. Like, you know what I mean? He also has nine people in his team to make sure that he has food ready. I only had three. I had my girlfriend. I had my best friend, my agent, and my physio. So we don't, I don't have the luxury of having... 13 people to tie my shoelaces like Roger Federer or you know make sure I have a white vest to walk on the court with I have to do these things mostly on my own so that's where a bit of understanding like to compare Nick Kyrgios to Roger Federer is ridiculous well hang on I'm not comparing you to him as a player or anything to do with his entourage or anything I'm just saying he'd never eat sushi at a press conference which is something you don't need to be told what to do do you 
But but what, what what's what's wrong with that? I'm 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 looking after my nutrition, and it's it's a very common thing that tennis players do in in every tournament. It's not it's not abnormal for a player to eat or snack on something, because. I just came off the court. I didn't have any time to do recovery. They, they told me that was my press conference time, so I had to eat. I had to eat. I, what, how would you feel? What do you want me to do? How would like, you feel if, while we're talking right now in an interview yep. that's going to be beamed around the world, I just start munching yep. on sushi? But you, but you didn't play. You didn't play at Wimbledon for four hours. You've no idea what you, I've you been had doing. You ample time to prepare to get breakfast. T- tennis. Yeah, but ten- tennis tennis is one of the only sports in the world where you don't know how long the match will go for. And it's, it could be an hour and a half, it could be four hours. So plans change, you have to be very adapt, you have to be able to adapt. That's why Novak's, for me, the greatest athlete because there's not like, it's like a football match where you play a certain 90 minutes mm-hmm. or, you know, it's an NBA game where you have 48 minutes. Of, it's like, there's so many things and intangibles that can happen. Like, I had to eat, it was not... Obviously, if my match went for an hour and a half, I would have said, oh, yeah, no, I'll eat later. But I had to eat at that time. OK. I, you- look, I, I'm not going to sit here and, and, like, if I was talking to Rafael Nadal or Novak Djokovic, I'd be like, yeah, no, 100%. You, mm. But Piers Morgan, it's like, it's a problem. <laughs> well, I'll tell you what is a problem for me is your inference earlier that I don't understand the mentality of an elite tennis player. I'd like to play you a clip of when I took on Serena Williams yes. in New York. That was nice. Oh, you, you're carrying on like Nick Kyrgios. It's like, you know. You know what? I'm proud of you. I'm proud of you. It wasn't Is it? Wimbledon, but... You know, I didn't want to play that clip, but you forced me into it with your taunting about me not being an elite-level tennis player. That is me oh. beating the greatest female player in history. Uh, I'm not claiming any credit. Obviously, I'm a man. Beating. I'm more powerful. I'm faster, uh, more skillful. Uh, but it, a win's a win. Yeah, you looked good. Your technique was a lot better than I thought, but you looked in a bit better shape back then, Piers. So <laughs> maybe when I get healthy, we, uh, we take it to the courts and, and we sort it out once and for all. Well, you know what? I'll do that. And, uh, and actually, I do need a bit more sushi in my diet. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> <laughs> Got to lay off the pints. <laughs> I want to play you a more serious clip, Nick, because uh, it's good fun joshing with you and you've obviously got a good sense of humour. Yep. But I want to play another clip from the, the Netflix uh, series. This is where you talk about when you went off the rails. I hated the kind of person I was. I was drinking, abusing drugs, lost my relationship with my family, pushed all my close friends away. You could tell I was hurting. Like, my whole arm was covered in scars, and that's why I actually got my arm sleeve to cover it all. 21 team was tough. Nick was, went, yeah, Nick was I've just never seen someone go through, and that's why sometimes, oh my God, (laughs) I get so upset when someone says, like, bad things about them because they don't know. I was genuinely contemplating if I wanted to commit suicide. I found that really shocking, Nick, and I read another interview you gave, a print interview, and you talked about feeling incredibly lonely, uh, very disconnected from your family. You were drinking heavily, sometimes 20, 30 drinks a night before big matches, taking drugs, partying till dawn. Uh, on yep. one occasion at Wimbledon in 2018, uh, your manager couldn't get Ooh. hold of you and used a phone app to track you and found you were 26 miles away, passed out in a random stranger's house. And you would spend days lying in the dark, uh, cutting and burning yourself. Um, mm-hmm. And i, I got to say, I found that incredibly shocking, but also incredibly courageous of you to put all this out there for the public to to learn. Yeah, um, I think I was at the point of my career last year when I came out about it and I was ready to open up. I think, I think last year I was actually ready to just put my story out there. And, you know, when I watch those clips that you just played, they're really emotional, but at the same time, inside I feel a lot better than I, I used to feel about that. And, mm. you know, I, I feel like... the 
I've helped so many people. Like after I opened up about it and put it on social media and then obviously the Netflix documentary highlighted a lot more of it. Um, I've almost been a beacon for people who are struggling and, you know, when they feel like they're overwhelmed and they're going towards, you know, drinking and, and drugs and stuff, they, they open up and they feel like I'm relatable because if someone like me can, first of all, make it to the tennis tour and then deal with all that as well as playing. Like those, those nights that I was having were before playing people like Rafael Nadal, um, you know, playing quality players on the HP tour and, and still being successful, I guess, where I was in the darkest period of my life. So if I'm able to pull myself out of it, um, that's one of the, been the most powerful thing in my career is people come to me with genuine issues and they send me photos in my Instagram DMs of them, you know, self-harming and, and genuinely wanting to commit suicide. And I have conversations with these people. Sometimes, you know, I've had phone calls with these people and you know, that's making a real difference mm. from my career. And I'm just really proud that I'm, you know, I, I watch those clips and I'm not really emotional about it. I start smiling because I know now the importance of family and how much those loved ones actually just wanted to care for me and protect me through all the criticism and, you know, when I couldn't deal with it. But now, you know, it's, it's night and day different, so. What was the absolute rock bottom moment for you when you look back at that period? Oh, there was, there was it's, I don't think there was one select um, moment. I think it was just all a year and a half to two years of just complete, just harm. I think it was, it was, it was, it was pretty dark to be honest. Um, you know, I won, I won tournaments, you know, on the professional tour, drinking every night, self-harming. I used to, you know, was burning things on my arm, cutting myself for fun. And, you know, I had people around me saying, this is not normal behavior. And I did have people around me that were caring, but I just, it was almost the more I kept doing it, it became an addiction of, of pain and, and, you know, I just didn't like, I, I hated myself. I hated waking up and being Nick Kyrgios. I hated going to places and tournaments and no one actually wanted to talk to me at face value. They just wanted me to be the, the entertainer or the crazy Nick Kyrgios. So I didn't feel like who I actually was was of any worth and it just got out of control. But then, you know, I somehow dug myself out of the hole. So... Nothing you say on Twitter can, can phase me, Piers, nothing. <laughs> that is very obvious, actually. Um, what also came clear was that Andy Murray uh, saw these marks on your arms and he reached out to you, didn't he? Uh, how important was that? Yeah, Andy, Andy was always a big supporter of, of me. As soon as I came on the tour, he, I don't know, he kind of saw uh, a work in progress, I, I think, and, and he always tried and took me under his wing. And then he realised later in my career that I was, I don't think I was coachable or could, you know, I was on my own path. But he was always someone that was looking out for me and wanted the best for me. So, yeah, he saw it and he said, well, what, what, what's that on your arm? And he was pretty bad at that stage. And when, you know, these, these are people in the locker room. So I'd be in the locker room and they, people would be able to see myself harm. So I could only imagine what people would think when they were actually versing me on the tennis court. They're like, wow, this guy is mentally in a, in, a, in a storm at the moment and he's still trying to play. And um, it would have been alarming for, for some of these players to see. And Andy was saying, look, you should, obviously he was trying to give me advice on it, but I was just so stuck in my ways at that time that I didn't listen. And obviously I'm very thankful. If he ever watches this, I'm sure Kyrgios and Piers Morgan, I'm sure he's going to tune in at some stage. Mm. Um, so yeah, I, I, thank, I thank him a lot. You know, I've got to know Andy over the years. There's a lot more to him than, than the kind of deadpan uh, mm. expressionless guy that people think he is. He's actually, he's a really funny guy. He's very mm. smart. Uh, he's very aware, I think, about his reputation, finds it funny and so on. But for you, it sounds like he was also, when it really mattered, he was trying to be a really good friend of yours. Yeah, we still, we still, you know, stay in touch from time to time. And I'm just really happy that he's able to come back and compete, you know, when he came back after his injury. And, you know, people were expecting him to, to be at the top of the sport again with, with these gods like Novak, Nadal and Federer. It was more just the fact of him still being there and to come back after an injury like that, I was super happy for him. And yeah, he's always been, you know, when we see each other in the locker room, we know that there's a lot of banter going to be happening. And I think we get along extremely well. Our, our humour is very similar. Um, I think he's hilarious. So when he got, you know, when people were branding him boring and no personality, I was like, they just don't know the true Andy Murray. Mm. Yeah, no, I completely agree. He's, he couldn't be more different. Was there one person who said something to yeah. you which managed to start the beginning of the future for you? When you look back, was there somebody, a conversation or a moment which went where you went, OK, because you're, you're talking a lot about not listening to people. There must have been a moment, I guess, when either you listened to someone or perhaps yourself. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, you just touched on it. Um, the, everyone that was, you know, in my circle or my loved ones always told me the right thing to do. But I guess it was just conversations that I had with myself. Um, it was, you know, at the end of the day, you can have everyone around you telling you which direction to go. But if you don't think that's the right way, then you're not going to get out of it. And I, I just had a conversation with myself and I was like, look, we got to got to do something about it. So I, I, I just tried little bit by little just to get some good habits, make some right choices. Um, and yeah, look, last year was the best year of, arguably the best year of my career, nearly won a Grand Slam, um, had the third best season on the planet. Um, and I just, from where I was to that, it was so emotional for me personally, because I just didn't think it was possible. I thought my time had gone where I'd have success off the court and on the court. You know, I had a, a great partner, I had a great friendship group and had amazing success in it. I'd, I'd never thought it was possible to be this happy, but I think that it's just more, I think it was me just day by day making the right choices. I actually wanted you to win that final. Thanks. Uh, <laughs> I mean, I'm surprised you've ever wanted me to win a tennis match. I think you'd <laughs> rather me just lose all the time. Well, instinctively, I don't like Australians winning anything, particularly cricket. Uh, but no, I did. I felt like you, you just electrified the tournament. And, you know, I, I, I thought that this is a guy who's complicated. But I used to like watching McEnroe, you know, when I was young. I remember McEnroe getting a lot of bad media, yep. bad attention. But I, I, I realised over time, much more, of course, since he's given interviews rather like you're doing these days, that a lot of it was driven by just this ferocious stuff going on inside him, this turmoil, this desire to be the best, but also a flawed, complicated mm. character. You know, which if you are one of those, if you're a very straightforward, well-adjusted person, then I guess you can rise to the top of the sport a lot easier than if you're complex. Yeah, I agree. And I think that's been uh, uh, very hard for people watching, the viewers, my fans. Even sometimes my, my closest friends or my family, they always want me to be, I guess, better somewhere like maybe not lose your temper or play this way or do this and do that but that's just not who I am and I feel like over time people have kind of been more comfortable with me just being Nick Kyrgios it's like okay we, we know that we're if we buy tickets to Nick Kyrgios we don't know what we're going to get we, we could get explosive tennis we could get entertaining tennis we could get something absolutely off planet earth that you've never seen before he might do something crazy and I think that's part of the the show I think sport and entertainment is one and I think that's why it's important. You have to have different personalities in sport. Otherwise, it's just, it will get a bit stale and boring. And I think you look at that City Pass match with me in Wimbledon, it was, it was insane. Like, mm. it was incredible. It was one of the best matches I've ever been a part of because of the crowd was involved, the people were involved. They made a Netflix doc documentary yeah. of it. Um, so, I mean, look, I've, had, I've definitely had a lot of fun um, playing my style of tennis. But look, if you're going to compare me to the greats of tennis, then... You've, you've set me up for failure. When you and McEnroe get together, does he give you advice, having gone through mm. pretty, pretty similar stuff when he was a young player? Um, look, I've never been... I don't think I've ever been defaulted from a match. You know, he, he broke all his rackets and had no rackets to play with and <laughs> had to get defaulted. So I don't think I've ever done that. I've walked off the court, but... Um, yeah, when me and Johnny Mac first met each other, I feel like we were both a bit on edge at Labor Cup because he was Team World's captain and I was like Team World's kind of camaraderie captain in that sense. And we both didn't know how we were going to be. And then we sat down, we had, you know, dinner together and we realised that um, we're pretty similar in the, in the sense where we're just, we're just, we're trying to be ourselves and we're just trying to be original and authentic. And I feel like he was really surprised that I was intellectually pretty switched on and and he doesn't really try and give me advice anymore. He, he knew pretty, pretty, pretty early that I was my own person. You said, I don't mind being the villain. I've definitely experienced stadiums where not one person has been going for me. It's a great feeling. You find some really dark energy when the whole stadium doesn't want you to win. Mm. Those are some of the best moments. The only thing I've had like that in my life was when I was a judge on America's Got Talent. And I was playing the bag, you know, the tough, meany judge. And I know that feeling to a degree in the sense of when they're all booing me, I used to love it. And so I, I do get that yeah. dark energy part. I've had it in a very yeah, different way. A but I get it and I used to get off on it, right? I mean, and you clearly do. I've seen you. Um, just talk about that for a moment. What's that feeling like when they're all going nuts and they're all shouting at you and all barracking you and booing? 
What do you actually feel? Yeah, you feel you feel like you feel like the the bad guy in a, in a movie. You feel like the main villain, and I love it. You know, I used to love going out. Not so much anymore. When when I go out to stadiums around the world now, it's like people are cheering, people are going crazy, people wanting to see the curios, I guess, the show, and and they're very supportive. Where back in the day when I used to show up to places, it was like even for practice, even when I entered the site, I needed extra security guards compared to the other players because of the hate. People just used to hate seeing my presence around the courts and they would boo my practices. They would throw, in Shanghai one year, people were throwing glass bottles on the court. It was just, it was, it was a riot and something just drove me to, it was just like addictive. Every time I went out on the court, I knew that I could spoil someone's day. I knew that I could just upset someone, be, be the bad guy in the fairy tale. So it was, it was a good feeling, but um, I think being loved a little bit better, being, being appreciated and, and being supported is definitely, I think, healthier. But yeah, the, the villain was good for a little bit. The, um, I mean, you talked about McEnroe being defaulted and you were very proud of the fact you've never got that far. You are the most fined player in the history of tennis, uh, £452,000 of fines. Are you proud of that record? It goes to charity. So on the flip side, I could be the most generous <laughs> ATP player ever. You said that with a completely straight <laughs> face. Yeah, look, I'm not, I'm not, sometimes when I watch, <laughs> look, sometimes when I watch my highlights back and I realize, look, I probably shouldn't have done that. Look, there's some, some regret in some of my actions, obviously. Like, I'm not going to sit here and say, no, that was always warranted no sometimes I do cross the line but competitors out there know that and I think if you look at other sports you know trash talking's normal you know these behaviors aren't as I guess repulsive but because it's tennis it's it's under a microscope it's very traditional and I understand that but um look you're, you're talking to someone who idolizes NBA and, and loves that culture and loves to trash talk and I think it's all healthy competition but yeah some of these behaviors aren't you know great and I've realized that the older I've become millions of kids around the world you know are watching my game and they want to meet me and I know that I try and have to you know I have to try and set a better example but look I can't change the past so I just gotta try and be better now I guess you um I, I know you don't well you sort of you don't want to you can't comment about the clip I'm about to show you from Wimbledon last year but it was a famous clip and really I just want to play okay. it to see what your facial reactions like let's take a look yeah, okay but why still here I gotta say, I did laugh. Yeah, that's just, it was heat of the moment and that's not the only time that something like that's happened. You know, you're playing in the biggest tournaments in the world, Wimbledon, Australian Open, French Open, US Open, and at these crucial moments, I think people sometimes, spectators, they don't understand that it can just be a, a fall in concentration for 20 seconds and then that can swing the entire tennis match. Mm. And especially against someone like Novak, I needed you know the stars to align that day. But yeah, look, a heat of the moment, quick chat. You, you and I both know in the heat of the moment we do come up with some of our best stuff. So um, <laughs> yeah, look. It's true. I can't control. Sometimes I would like the crowd to understand the, the severity of just one point in a tennis match. One point in a tennis match can swing for the next 20 minutes. So yeah, it's, 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 it's tough. At, at, the, uh, at the start of your career, when you were about 20 and things were really going off the rails, Shane Warne, the late, great Australian cricketer, was a good friend of mine. He, he wrote an open letter to you. Uh, this is after that defeat yep. to Andy Murray, after I did my, my tweet to you, actually. Uh, and he said, Dear Nick Kyrgios, I was about to read, that, read what he wrote. Yep. Dear Nick Kyrgios, we all realise you're only 20 and have a lot to learn, buddy. Please don't waste your talent. Everyone in the world, especially us Australians, want to respect you. Remember, respect is way more important than being liked. You need to respect the game of tennis and yourself. We all make mistakes, but it's how we learn from them and the way we conduct ourselves when we lose that shows true character. Mm -hmm. You're testing our patience, mate. Show us what you're made of and how hungry you are to be the best in the world. It's time to step up and start winning. No excuses, no shame in losing, but show us you'll never give up. You'll give everything to be the best you can be. Respect is earned, not given. I believe in you. I know you can do it, but now's the time, my friend. My first question is, did you, did you see that open letter at the time? 
Uh, yeah, I, I saw it um, and didn't read it. Um, but yeah, uh, look, I feel like I've been the closest Australian player in the last decade to win a Grand Slam. I, was, I made the final. Um, I've had a pretty successful career. I feel like I've won a lot more than I've lost. Um, able to provide for my family, friends. Um, and yeah, respected by millions around the world, obviously. Um, and yeah, I, I'm just, I've done it my way. So look, at the, at, at the end of the day, I know that these other Australian athletes, um, you know, just wanted to see me succeed. And mm. I've only ever supported most of them as well. And I've only wanted the best for them. I've never, never going to be the first one to go out on social media and put someone down. If someone does that to me, I'll respond. But um, yeah, look, I mean, I look back at that letter and I look back at how far I've come and I'd say, he would be proud for sure. I think he absolutely would. I, I, and there's a lot about your personality, which is very warny like you know, it wasn't like he was any, uh, by his own admission, he was no angel. Um, this was a guy that went through a lot of stuff himself. I think he genuinely was trying to give yep. you advice from someone who'd been there in the coal face of the cauldron of international sport, recognised you were young, saw some traits perhaps of his own, yep. and was genuinely trying to help you. Did you ever meet Shane after that? No, I never, I never was able to meet Shane. I guess his schedule would have been, excuse me, um, his schedule would have been crazy. And obviously with my travel, I think that would have been one person that would have probably, we would have got along really, really well. Yeah. Um, but yeah, look, um, I, 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 I haven't met too many of these Australian athletes just because the, the schedules are so different and we just have a lot going on. Your early story, uh, Nick, is really fascinating because you were the last of three children uh, born to a uh, Georgia father and uh, Nil, your mother. Yep. Um, your dad emigrated to Australia yep. uh, from Greece, age seven, and was a, a decorator. Your mum was born in Malaysia as part of the royal family, actually, and moved to Australia with her mother when she was 12 and hmm. became a, a software sure. engineer. It's an unusual pathway uh, for, uh, for someone like you to have come from this, this background and this journey your parents went on. How much is there... I guess resilience they would have had to have had to have gone through all this when they were young. How much of that streak is in you from that, do you think? Huge. I mean, that's where most of my motivation comes from. You know, my dad is nearly getting on the, uh, the latest stages of 60 and continues to work every day. You know, his mindset, um, you know, came with nothing and everything that he's built. I guess he, he sees me kind of carrying the work and doing, you know, these interviews or, you know, being an entrepreneur in a couple of things and obviously playing the tennis. I think he's super proud because he sees, you know, some of his work ethic in, in me and I try and that's really part of my motivation. And, you know, my mum obviously has dealt with so many different health issues over the last decade, and especially over the last two years, you know, so every day with her is a blessing and I understand that. And it's, it's, it's been hard playing majority of my career with my mum having severe health problems. It's been tough, but She's one of the strongest women I know. And um, yeah, those, I, I have honestly, everyone that comes to my house, they understand of how amazing my parents are. They, they, they look after everyone, they feed everyone, they make sure they try and connect with everyone, make everyone feel special. And yeah, I mean, look, they're, they're the best. I, I have no complaints. They, with a, I look back at some of the, the dinners that we had, you know, we had twenty dollars for three for three children at dinners, and 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 I didn't know any different. I I, I was growing up thinking I had the best life. So um, she, my mum was awesome. My dad's awesome. So that's yeah, yeah. In in May this year, your mother was held up at gunpoint by a masked man at the family's home in in Canberra. You gave chase and actually injured your foot, resulting in missing the the French Open. That's a scary thing to happen, particularly with your mother having already going through health issues? Yeah, just just tough. You know, thinking about that moment, it's still very raw. It was actually quite recent. Um, just, yeah, that's, that's something that I never thought would, that my career would bring would be people, you know, coming to my doorstep where my, my family have lived for 30 plus years and, you know, you hold a gun to my, to my mum and, and ask for a car. It's like to, to, to come steal a car, it's, it's, you could take the car, but the trauma that you've left on, on my mum and, and our family is, is I think you can't heal ever from something like that. Um, so yeah, look, it, my career has brought me many beautiful things and the platform I have to help people is amazing. But these are things that just, I have to deal with that majority of humans don't deal with. And it's been really hard for the family to get over that. Um, 
but yeah, it was just a, it was a horrific morning, to be honest. I just remember my mum screaming and I, I rushed to the front door, cut my foot on something and it was just gashing out blood and it was just, a, it was a disaster. So yeah, I mean, look, we're, as, but we're a strong contingent. We're going to get through it. And my mum's doing, you know, she's seeing people to help her um, mental state over it still. And, you know, she'll be, she'll be fine. Did you, I mean, what happened to the person that did this? Um, I think he's, you know, legally going to get dealt with and, and we'll see. Your mother um, recently also said that it, she can't watch you play anymore, that it just makes her too anxious and she stopped watching you. How did you feel about that? Uh, yeah, sure. She's got a pacemaker now as well. So I don't think she could come to any of my matches, um, especially Australian Open or Wimbledon with the ups and downs and the, the craziness that happens. I mean, it's just too risky. So um, she watches from home. So my whole team usually comes watch me play. And if I'm in Australia, everyone will come watch live and she'll just stay back at the accommodation or wherever we're staying and just watch it on TV and, and support me from there. And I know that she's watching me all the time. Um, I've stressed that woman out so much and I'm sorry. Um, I'll say that on probably one of the biggest shows ever. But she, she's really proud of my work and how much that I've grown. But yeah, I, I just wish that maybe she can watch me, you know, one last time if I, you know, I, once I come back from injury and I'm playing at the Australian Open, I would love for her to come for just one more match. Um, that would be a dream, you know, to, to watch her. Because she was the one from, from day dot that was always there from under, under eights to tens to, to now. So it would be really, really, really special if she can, she can tough it out for a, for a couple of years more. She uh, did a, a, a piece when she talked about her own upbringing when she first came from Malaysia to Australia, age 12. Said it was quite traumatic. She said, I can remember sitting on a bench wishing that someone would ask me to play those memories are very painful to be isolated, to be called whatever names people call someone with dark skin. Um, so that was racism she was experiencing. Yeah, we've, the Curios family has definitely dealt with their fair share of racism um, in Australia. But look, it, it's just such a silly topic for me. I don't, I don't like speaking about it. But yeah, it's, it's been tough um, for us. You know, some of the legends of our sport have, have told told my, me and my family to go back to where we came from. And, you know, we've, we've, I was born in Australia, grown up there and, and represented the country for, for 27 years with anything I've done. So it's definitely been something um, that we've had to deal with, but it just makes you stronger. I've got incredibly thick skin and it's all, it's all a process. And, and one day I hope that this topic's just not, not mentioned anymore. Yeah, when you, when you said that it's a silly thing for you, do you mean that it's just something you have to constantly get asked about and deal with, and you'd rather that you could just be judged on the content literally of your character and your play than anything to do with your skin color or background. Yeah, definitely. I just feel like, you know, you look at my friendship group, I have, you know, I have all different types of friends from everywhere and we just get along so well. And I think it's just such a silly topic. You know, we're all human beings at the end of the day. We can all, when we work together, we all do some incredible things together. Um, and yeah, you know, whether you're white or black doesn't matter to me. So I'm, uh, yeah, it's just a very silly topic. You, um, your old agent, Verse spotted you, wrote down in his notepad at the time, chubby, mouthy, but unbelievable hand this skills. Funny. Uh, well, you're definitely not chubby anymore. Um, and you've got unbelievable hand skills still, and you're still pretty mouthy. So he was, two out of three survived, but uh, it's quite amazing your, your physical transformation. <laughs> When you look at that picture of yourself, uh, can you believe that guy has become one of the great athletes of his country? I mean, I'll take that as you call me good looking. Thanks, Piers. Um, <laughs> yeah, my compliments are hard to come by from you. <laughs> but yeah, look, I look at these photos of when I was young and yeah, the, the, there's a fair glow up, that's for sure. But um, yeah, look, I didn't think, I think mean, that's just hope. You look at those pictures when I was young and any kid that has dreams and and things they want to achieve. Just that's, that's your inspiration right there, for sure. Like I was overweight most of my, most of my life. Um, so if I'm able to pull it together and, and you know, just keep chipping away, it doesn't happen overnight, chipping away, chipping away, you can get Piers Morgan to call you good looking on, on, on TV. <laughs> I think I actually said you, you'd lost weight. I didn't go as far as saying you're good looking. No, I don't know, we'll replay that. We'll save that clip. I'll, I'm, I'm definitely posting that. Tell me about your love life. Because you're very happy uh, with Coz, uh, Hatsy. You met online in 2021. Yep. 
And within months, you took a bold move, Nick Kyrgios. You tattooed her name on your thigh. That is a perilous thing to do early in a relationship. Yeah, it is. Um, yeah, me and Cos met uh, almost, we've almost been together for two years. Uh, December 31st is our anniversary. Um, so yeah, life with her has been amazing. Um, I feel like, you know, you, you love someone when you, you know, you've been given a bit of adversity. We, you know, we did the, we traveled the world together with airports. We had delays. You know, things that I've come from, the baggage that I've brought into the relationship. She's, she's dealt with it amazing. Um, and we just get along well. Everything's easy with her. Um, and back to the tattoo. I was actually in a tattoo parlor and I was getting something covered up. And then she was like, I was like, do you want me to get you tattooed? It was just like, I just threw it out there. And then she was like, no, nah, no, nah, you don't have to. And then secretly I knew that that was me shooting myself in the foot. I was like, oh, no, I have, I have to do it. I have to do it now. So she was like, no, you better do it. And then I had to get a little one on my on my leg. And yeah, it's fine. You know, she's definitely the one. I've, I'm past all that drama in relationships. It's 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 a special one. Uh, when you said you were covering something up, that wasn't the name of a previous girlfriend, was it? Maybe, maybe. <laughs> so you've done your research. <laughs> Actually, I was guessing, but it, it made sense. Oh, yeah, guessing. I was. I was legitimately guessing. There's nothing on here that says you were take, getting rid of a previous girl's name. But it makes sense. If you're impetuous and put women's names on your thighs, you're going to have to get rid of some of them, right? <laughs> yeah, I guess so. <laughs> uh, do you think you're going to get married? I know you want four kids, she wants two. I know that much, but you're going to get married? How do, how, do you know, how do you know this stuff? I, you're, you're, a, you secretly love Nick Kyrgios. You're a stalker. Because, you know why I know? Because I'm a proper professional journalist at the top of my game, <laughs> like you in tennis. Hey, that's true. I, I'll, give you, I'll give you props. I'll give you props. You are very professional. And yeah, look, one day, definitely. Um, you know, I'm 28 now and obviously want to have a big family one day. You know, I think I'm a very family orientated person. So is she. She's Got an amazing family back home in, in Sydney. So, yeah, I, will, I would love to have a basketball team. But for, like, I would try, like to have five, six maybe. Um, but, yeah, I think she's just set on two. So we'll see. I'll ask you a question I asked Cristiano Ronaldo and uh, Zlatan Ibrahimovic, because you're obviously at that level, okay. um, which is, let me give you yep. a choice. You can win Wimbledon next year. You can beat Djokovic in an absolute thriller. Uh, or... You can have great okay. sex, but you can't have both. Which one are you going to take? This is a tough question. It's not really a tough question. Um, I'm taking option two. Really? Because, look, I made the final already, so, <laughs> I mean, I'm not going to lose option two. What are you going to do about your career? A lot of rumours flying around that you were going to give up, retire, if you'd beaten Djokovic last year, but you're still young. I mean, Djokovic is, like, eight years older than you. Are you really going to throw the towel in anytime soon? I mean, is, are we not in an era where Cristiano Ronaldo and these guys, they show you can go until 40? I mean, could you not be doing this in five, six years, maybe long, longer? Yeah, I think, um, you know, soccer's got a little bit of a different, you know, setting. You know, you don't have to compete at the absolute highest level in the EPL or, you know, La Liga. You, you have all these different leagues where you can get paid amazing amounts and kind of not play it maybe you know, 60, 70 percent. If, if that was an option for tennis, definitely I would reassess my options. You know, at, uh, at the moment I'm dealing with some health issues. So just trying to get back healthy. I, I definitely don't see myself, you know, going anywhere in the, any, in the near future. But, you know, I want to get back on the tour and have one to two more really, really good years. And I think that's possible. Um, and then after, if, if there's some more leagues, you know, that are offering some nice money, then, yeah, I'll, I'll definitely look on extending my career. But you know, the, there's a lot of work in the tennis world that needs to be done. Um, and yeah, look, I'm a day by day guy. I don't like setting goals or plans. I just take every day and see how my body's feeling. And, you know, when I have kids one day, I want to be able to, you know, run outside without pain and then play with them and, and still be pretty youthful. So, um, yeah, look, plans can change. You know what you do when you have kids, as I discovered with mine, is that the moment they start behaving badly at sport, you'll be all over them. Stop that. Behave yourself. Oh, definitely. Definitely. I'm going to be one of the strictest parents ever. <laughs> You've got a, a new show coming out. It's called Good Trouble, which is a perfect title, really. Is that really how you see yourself? Yep. Are you basically the bad boy of tennis, but underneath it, you've got a good soul? Yeah, I mean, that's, that's, that's a nice way to put it. I think I've, been, I've kind of been branded, you know, the bad boy of tennis. I think everyone who knows me and 
that's around me don't I don't fit that mold at all. You know, I'm just authentic. But yeah, Good Trouble is the um, is the show that's coming, and you know, I'm really super excited about it. We've done Francis Tiafo, um, you know, Mike Tyson, Gordon Ramsay's coming on it, so it's going to be incredible. It's you know, we sit down for 20 to 25 minutes, and we get really intimate about their journey, you know, turning points, who were some of their idols growing up, their beliefs. So yeah, it's it's I think it's like a talk show, but almost like we haven't seen before, you know, we never haven't really heard from, you know, people like Gordon Ramsay, what he went through, his journey um, growing up and the, the critics and just the, I guess the negativity that these kind of people have dealt with and how they navigated through that. Um, you know, this this got a special place in, in talk shows for sure. You know who you should be interviewing for your show? Me. I mean, hey, do you want to come on? Yes. Yeah, we, could, we could set it up, it'd be pretty good. <laughs> That would be, I think, round two after right, this interview. I think after this interview airs, the public will be clamouring for another re for a rematch somewhere, and it may as well be on your terms. Yep. And I, I, I'm going to ask you some deep questions, Piers. We're going to get <laughs> deep and emotional. <laughs> I look forward to it, Nick Kyrgios. It's been actually a great pleasure, and I mean that. Uh, you've, you've given a great interview. Uh, I've grown to know you a lot better, and I think understand you a lot better. And like I say, I was cheering you on last summer. And I can't wait for you to be back in action. And I feel like we should go to the Dog and Fox in Wimbledon Village, where I used to go as a kid. And we should just have a few pints and, oh. you know, start take this bromance to the next stage. Oh, you're twisting my arm. I don't know if I can, I don't know if I can take you up on a few beers. <laughs> Who knows? <laughs> Nick Kyrgios, thank you very much. <laughs> See you, Piers. See you later.